Oh, I think, yes, we're live. Hello. Um, I, you know, this is my second time doing this, so um, I think we're live. Um, the <laughs> broadcast button says is red, so I'm assuming we're live and we're streaming. This is my uh, second TGI Kubernetes episode, and I have, well, first of all, I'm Vladimir Vivian, and I have with me co-worker uh, John Schnicky. Is it Schnicky, right? Schnocky. Schnocky. It's not, not an easy name. That's all right. <laughs> it's all good. So today, uh, again, this is episode 170, and uh, we will be talking about, we'll talk about a, a bunch of things, but specifically we'll, we'll uh, focus on testing, uh, testing framework, and anything uh, and other tools that are out there to, to facilitate testing. But before we do that, let me check to see. Uh, actually, no. Let me, uh, oh, you know what I forgot to do, of course, is pull up the comments. There we go. Comments. Hey, so the comments are starting to stream in. Hello oh, from the you Netherlands. You, do you see him? Yeah, yeah. I was looking at, at private chat. So oh, yeah. This is this is Vladimir's second time doing this. This is my first time. So I will be a little more clueless. Um, uh, it's okay. But uh, I'm here to assist Vlad. And I've been at um, VMware for a couple of years now, and almost exclusively working on and around testing in Sana Bui. And, uh, and so that'll be part of the, the show we do today. So hopefully we can give you all some, some good information. Awesome. And we do have a packed show. So as folks are streaming in, I see uh, you know people from uh, pretty much around the world now that uh, TGIK has been running for a few years now. So we cover the globe with uh, Kubernetes. Um, so we we have folks streaming in from Libya. Um, I saw somebody. Oh, Netherlands. Netherlands. Yeah. Hello, That's Wally. something really, really neat when I was watching back old TGIK episodes, uh, <laughs> seeing just the, the breadth of uh, reach. I think yeah. that's, that's really amazing. It is. It is. Um, so, uh, you know, as folks are streaming in, we can get started with uh, the weekend in review. And um, it has been a busy week for uh, for us at uh, VMware and also the community at large, uh, the uh, Kubernetes community. So we're going to talk about a few things. Um, one of the first news item is what we're calling TCE or the Tanzu Community Edition. So it is finally uh, made public. Uh, it is a project that I've I had a small part in, but it was a uh, it was a very satisfying part because uh, I had to uh, uh, spend some time and and add a plug in. So what I would say is definitely check out uh, the tons of community edition. Um, it is, let me see what happens if I let me open it up. There you go. Yeah, I went to this today. There's a little uh, try me that uh -huh. goes through one of those VMware workshops. Uh, that's really slick. And you know, you don't even have to manually copy and paste if you want to follow their steps It has little buttons, just click to run it in their little terminal, you don't have to install anything. Right, um, right. So that was really nice if you want to try it out. It is definitely nice. And you know, the thing that I, as somebody who's an engineer and work on code, I, you know, I got really excited once I actually got involved in the project because what it is not only a product, but it's also a platform. Um, so the community edition, um, it is open source. It, it's it's on GitHub. You can, uh, I don't see the, let me see, will that take me to GitHub? I think if you scroll all the way to the bottom, I think yeah. the GitHub link's there. Yeah, uh, yes. So it's on GitHub. The entire thing is on GitHub. Um, and what I wanted to say is it's not just a, a project, but it's also a platform. And it's it's it has some very interesting way of of abstract uh, of uh, abstracting your your um, your uh, uh, abstracting Kubernetes and everything underneath it. Um, and it's you know I, I can't wait to see what the community builds with it and. Um, you know, I can't wait to get back in the, in, into it and, and, and keep contributing. So definitely check out uh, TCE, the Tanzu Community Edition. Um, like John mentioned, you can give it a try as a 
thing that you can run Kubernetes on, or you can dive into the code and create things with it. So uh, we're excited here and, um, and to see what the, what the community does with it. Yeah, the, right. the demo that as you go through is, is kind of neat because it, you know, it it's, it's kind of skips over the part of setting up the cluster, but the Tanzu CLI will let you configure, you know, any set of clusters, tear it up or uh, build it up, tear it down. But it mainly goes through showing you like how you can uh, right. install packages. Mm -hmm. it's normally, you know, be multi-step, complicated install processes, but it's like a single command, and then you get to see all the dashboards and everything that it sets up. That's awesome. So it was nice. Yeah, it was. It's a lot of hard work. A lot of people contribute a lot of hard work internally to get that out the door, and uh, it's finally here. So definitely take a look at it. And yeah, one uh, of the links there too in the notes is the uh, the roadmap people can, can oh, look yeah. through and see what's coming up in just like zero to three months, three to six months. A lot of it is building on that foundation of like, what does the community want for packages? Oh, right. What can we help streamline? What can we make look a little nicer? Uh, so anything you can either contribute there in terms of ideas or actual code, hey, it's all open source. We love the, the help. Yep, awesome. All right, we got a, quite a, a few other things. Let's keep going here. Um, Oh, cartographer. That's another one. Um, so cartographer uh, is another uh, VMware sponsored open source. Um, what I like, so this morning as I was getting ready for the show, uh, kind of went through the uh, little link to kind of check out things because, you know, it's so many, so many things coming out. It's hard to keep up. So I checked this out and, and Joe had told me about it. And it's very interesting to see how you know, a lot of time we build application on top of Kubernetes, but now we're seeing folks using the Kubernetes um, objects, the Kubernetes, um, uh, uh, the, the actual Kubernetes uh, mechanism to build things. And this is one of those projects where uh, you're using Kubernetes to create uh, what we're calling um, to automate and choreograph events within the Kubernetes ecosystem. So you can do things like you know automating build and deployment, et cetera, et cetera. Now, cartographer is probably not the first thing they're trying to do it, but it's definitely an interesting way of using Kubernetes to drive that process. Um, check it out. Um, it's it's a uh, again it's open source, um, and this uh, the link that's on the document pretty much goes over everything about the project and and how it works. Um, this is my second day learning about it and it's it's very interesting it's one of those i'm eventually i want to get get around and and uh, give it a try so if you can check it out so it's cartographer um did you get a chance to check it out um john i didn't look too much at uh, cartographer but yeah we, even just looking at that basic splash page you get kind of the idea that it's going to be a more uh, kubernetes native way to kind of do like build packs and stuff like that i'm assuming right. Maybe it's using like the CRDs and controllers to to manage yep. the flow of data throughout. Exactly, it, it's using uh, the Kubernetes primitives directly to express um, uh, the workflow, the build workflow, and automate it as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. Um, all right, so the next one is uh, let's see what do we got. Uh, guard chain, yeah. Or chain guard. Is it chain guard? Chain guard, yeah uh was looking at that it uh you know i don't know the details of it as well but it definitely has a uh impressive list of uh companies on their on their splash page right the, all the talk of secure by default uh mm -hmm. even in your your ci flows uh that's definitely important right you can't just always think uh, everything in ci can be completely open and then magically it will be safe and secure when you're right. to production because that's somebody else's job that's that's the <laughs> way i do it well, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a, it's very interesting, and I, I think the I think the this is from an ex VMware guy, uh, Scott Nichols, I believe. But yeah, it's a very interesting um, concept, and um, definitely check it out. Uh, it's definitely a, a great addition to the uh, to the community of tooling uh, around Kubernetes. Um, Oh, going back to TCE, I see somebody added uh, an additional link. Amanda and Josh gave 
you know, somebody, somebody is busy um, updating this. Um, chain guard, uh, Kubernetes, oh, Kubernetes cluster API. So another uh, announcement uh, development this week is in the uh, for cluster API, which has reached its coveted production readiness uh, release version 1.0. Um, and cluster API, if you don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's the underpinning of a lot of um, projects, including the Tanzu projects that uh, we were just discussing earlier. Um, it's been around for a while and, you know, it's been in the oven getting baked for quite a lot, quite a while. So now with, with, um, with this release, it's, uh, it's uh, version 1.0. So with that version, <clears throat> excuse me, there's been a, uh, uh, this blog post that, uh, that went out so you can learn all about uh, who's using it, how it's being used. Um, and you know why do we feel that, uh, or the, the the folks who work on the project feel that it's it's uh, ready for uh, for production? So take definitely check it out. Um, I'm not doing it justice by uh, just rattling a few things about it because Cluster API is a very important uh, uh, open yeah, source. I mean, project. from from my perspective, ever since I've been at uh, VMware, it's been uh, a highlight of people working on it. A lot of effort. And it's it's also reassuring to know, and I, I think they mentioned it on that page, or if, if not that one on their main splash page, how it's not just a, a VMware product. There's a ton of input from the the community at large, right? Um, getting Kubernetes to manage Kubernetes and um, control your your other clusters, and so you can have real clusters of clusters, and it's all managed uh, internally, natively. Um, everything needs to to be moving that way. So one yeah. is is huge. Yes, it's a definitely huge. And then along with uh, the one dollar announcement, we had um, the introduction of uh, uh, cluster API cluster class. Um, and this is from uh, Fabrizio, who is one of the uh, main contributor and lead in, in, in a cluster API as well. And cluster class is, you know, interestingly in, in Kubernetes parlance, where, where whenever you hear class, you're thinking of a class of things that you can use as a template to drive other things. So cluster class is basically what it sounds like. It's, it's a way of defining some sort of template that you can stamp out clusters without having to repeat the same thing over and over. So this is a, uh, a, a blog post around cluster uh, cluster class and managed topology. So definitely uh, check it out. Uh, this is on the uh, Kubernetes IO website. Um, I think this was published, oh yeah. Uh, today. So definitely check it out. Um, I think, again, as uh, as John mentioned, you know, Cluster API is a is a great uh, project, a great addition. And, you know, can't wait to see what folks are doing with it. And if you need proof what can be done with Cluster API, uh, no, look no further than what we're doing with um, with a ton uh, with a ton of projects. All right. I mean, it, Go ahead. I'm excited about the cluster class because every other UI you use, whether it's through, um, you know, Azure, AWS, or Kind, you're setting up your cluster. You just have to manually specify everything about the cluster, kind of just right. to get it set up. So to be able to just to say like, I want a basic dev cluster, and it just makes the assumptions about what that means, or right. I need a, you know, a cluster with a ton of memory. Like there's going to be a class for that, or something that has GPU capabilities, like. Just do that. You know, you don't have to know all the details. You know, the, the more we abstract, uh, hide under the covers, it's a little bit easier for everyone to use on top. Absolutely, absolutely. Abstraction, abstraction, abstraction. Um, the next uh, news is uh, Valero uh, one point seven. My screen keeps moving because I think folks are still editing. Um, uh, where is it, Valero? And I just lost my spot. Uh, there you go. New release it starts. With there you go. Valero uh, 1.7. So that's out. Check it out. Uh, and if you don't know what Valero is, again, it's um, Valero is a, a VMware <clears throat> sponsored open source in the space of um, uh, cluster backup. Um, so definitely check it out. Uh, 1.7 uh, project. 
Oh, this is another, uh, this announcement, I'm not sure when it was added, but I just copied it. Uh, this is just to let us know that Project uh, project Open Service Mesh now supports Contour. Contour. So definitely check that out. Uh, let's see what we, there you go. So uh, the link takes you to um, the release note and you can read all about it. Again, some of these, I, I did not have time to dive deep into it. So we're, I'm seeing them as, as I'm reading them, so um, the next one thing about the uh, right. I'll, I'll go back to the the Valero release because I was looking at their release notes. Um, they're well structured. Two big things because they separate into highlights and detail changes. But uh, distro lists, I know that matters to a lot of uh, people for adoption. But then also uh, a nice little debug uh, flag to to get like a little service bundle, uh, which will help just everybody. Helps solve problems faster. Helps you report your problems faster. Um, so hopefully that will just only increase momentum. Uh, just to, since you mentioned the debug uh, function, uh, shameless plug, uh, that is using Crash D, which we did a show about, I think back in a few months back, I don't remember exactly when. Um, so anyway, let's go back to the list. Uh, the next set of uh, items in the news are all have to do with uh, <clears throat> Uh, SIGs, Kubernetes SIGs. Uh, Everybody wants help. Help. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so um, again, I don't know. You know, some of you may already be uh, contributing to to uh, Kubernetes, or you may not be. But uh, you know, getting involved with a SIG uh, is a great way to start slow and and find uh, ways to help out in the community. It a lot of time it's not even code. A lot of time it's you know just what we call a chop wood and care water type of activities uh just to help keep the lights on but some of it is code as well so take it definitely if you're just interested i mean i remember when i started out uh, i don't go to a, a lot of the sig meetings anymore but um, when i first started working with kubernetes i would just go and shadow when they have their sig meetings right like you can just join listen to hear what their problems are because when you're outside of the community it's just this black box that seems really big and confusing Kubernetes, but when you see it's broken down into these little SIGs and day to day, there are very tangible problems that each group is trying to solve. You know, right. sometimes it's organization or it's refactoring or it's just a, a set of new features or they just need the input. And uh, you, you might be really surprised how much you can contribute even if you're relatively new to the community. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah, so definitely take it's uh, I think we have three SIGs, uh, infra, node, and auth. And as John mentioned, all of them are looking for uh, contributors. So definitely uh, check check them out. Uh, Kubernetes steering committee elections are on the way. Um, as you know, next week is uh, KubeCon. Um, you know, uh, big, big, this is a big moment for uh, for everyone in the community because, you know, this is our yearly North America um, uh, get together. Uh, last year, obviously, for obvious reason, it was all virtual, but this year it is, I believe it's a mix, virtual plus uh, in person. So as that is going on, we're also gonna have Kubernetes steering committee elections and and basically, it's a way for you to get even more involved in in the how the community uh, the Kubernetes project is actually uh, ran and managed. Um, so you get your voice heard by becoming a, a community member. And basically, what you do is open. <laughs> I love this. You open up a um, a PR in GitHub. Uh, either you or somebody else may uh, may nominate you. And uh, say hey, I'm interested in becoming a uh, a member. I don't see. I saw. There you go. Serving community nomination, and you know, so that we have several folks from uh, VMware, but we have folks from all over the place um, that are uh, creating PRs to be nominated or have been nominated by somebody else. Yeah, you can self nominate. Uh, it's awesome on there. And it's kind of fun just to scroll through, see who you know, give them a yeah. thumbs up, and kind of support their nomination. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, this last one is October 13th, Linux Foundation is holding Ospology, um, which has to do with open source 
Um, I went to the website and checked it out. Uh, but it's basically an event about open source and I guess the business of uh, not the business, but the 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 way open source is, is ran, I guess. Um, so if you're interested, definitely check it out. Um, anything else? I don't think I have. Let me see. Can we support? Can we, Go ahead. Can we, can we support nominations? Uh, Wally asks. Yes. By that, I mean, yeah, just thumbs up, I think. Is, is yeah, that let me, or do, do you need to comment in some other way? No, I, I, just give, I just give thumbs up. If you go to, like, let's look at like a PR. Um, uh, like, for instance, Tim Pepper, he's from just either thumbs up or something like that, uh, plus one. This is how you, um, this is basically how you vote. Um, so, yeah. That's the vote. Easy way to show some support. Show some <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. All right. Move, moving on. Um, actually, I think I did cover. Yeah. So um, I think actually it was uh, somebody from um, from the chat said they were uh, updating the um, they're updating the, the the notes and they added. Um, the presentation that Amanda okay. and Josh did, which is awesome talk. If you want to know what tons of community uh, community edition is, definitely take a look at the talk, um, and it'll give you a, at a super high level what it is. Uh, Josh did a, an excellent uh, walkthrough of the of the project, the CLI, and how it works, et cetera, et cetera. So definitely, um, I just wanted to highlight that the link that uh, that was added. All right, I think that's it, man. All right. So All right. are we going to go down? Yeah, you want to intro what we're uh, the main topic of? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So testing and in the new testing framework. So basically, if what we the main the the main thing we're going to talk about today is the E2E testing framework or the new E2E testing framework, and we'll get to that. But before we get to that, I, I just want to kind of rattle on about why we're even doing uh, a new framework. Um, let me close some of these that I open. Wow. A lot of news, a lot of news, and hopefully um, you guys will have time to check them out. Okay, so this is the E2E testing framework or the Kubernetes SIGs E2E testing framework, and it's basically a Go framework that helps you create uh, tests, but why are we even doing that? Well, that's because... Um, there is a framework baked into Kubernetes right now that we all use. If if you write code for uh, inside Kubernetes, um, chances are before your new code can be merged or be accepted, it has to pass some sort of end-to-end um, -end test. And that test, again, if you're writing uh, directly in Kubernetes, Kubernetes, which is the, the main repo for Kubernetes, that framework is there for you to use. The problem with that is it, 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 it's a framework that has grown organically with Kubernetes, um, and it's hard or even impossible to reuse a lot of the good work that has been done over the years. Um, I've tried to, to, to vendor, naively try to vendor um, <laughs> the stuff that's in there, and it, it doesn't work. Um, if, you, if you vendor one thing, you vendor everything. And you I don't mean like everything in the test framework. <laughs> right. Every like all of Kubernetes almost all of Kubernetes will come down and everything associated with Kubernetes. So yeah. Um Some so of those last... now, especially with Windows support, are huge oh, yes. because it's like entire Windows library type stuff, all their types, entire, right. you know, AWS everything structure and right, right, right. So yeah, it's it's definitely impossible. So last year around uh, around this time, I started talking to um, a few people internally and who are involved in upstream with uh, SIG testing. And we're 
we're looking around at, at ways to take the best of what was already done in inside the Kubernetes testing framework and see if we can um, create a project where we have an API uh, via a uh, Go package that you can that is highly reusable. That if you come to a point where you need to create tests for your Kubernetes resources as you're creating Kubernetes Kubernetes tools or tools application even that are uh, destined to live in Kubernetes, but you don't want to go through the exercise of recreating a um, a test framework every time. And I've seen it done. Um, and that was one of the motivation behind uh, behind this. Now, one of the thing that if you've been around Kubernetes and you've actually written Kubernetes code that are tested, you, you've heard other projects that have to do with um, with Kubernetes testing. So you probably heard of uh, kubetest2. Um, uh, where is it? So you've heard of kubetest2. Um, and you've probably heard of uh, Son of Boy, which uh, John, I'll let John talk about what Son of Boy is in a minute. But these are different um, different pieces of, of the testing uh, of the testing problem that we're solving, right? For instance, kubetest2 is more of a localized framework or a local framework you can use to launch tests. Uh, you can use it to orchestrate your test, but all the tests are running locally. Um, so that's basically all it does. Um, Son of Boy takes a, again, I'll, I'll let John drive Son of Boy in a minute because he is one of the main engineers on Son of Boy and I will let him uh, wax poetic about Son of Boy um, for a few minutes, but I wanted to put Son of Boy down because uh, also Son of Boy is part of that uh, testing sphere where we need something to automate the launching of tests on 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 your on your cluster. That's one of the things Son of Boy is good at. And then now we come to what we're about to cover today, which is the E2E testing framework, is is closer to the code, meaning that this framework is what, as a developer writing or building or creating Kubernetes um, uh, resources or, or code that are destined to live in a Kubernetes cluster, how do I test that? And that is what the framework, uh, that's what the E2E test framework addresses. Now, before we get, jump too deep into the framework, um, you know, there are different tests, kind of tests out there. One of the main tests that a lot of, a lot of people write, especially in folks that are working on Kubernetes is, is what we call conform, conformance tests. Um, and conformance tests is one of the big chunk of tests that are part of Kubernetes. And those are written, you, like I said earlier, if you're gonna create something that is part of Kubernetes, it has to pass some sort of test. And one of the tests it has to pass our uh, conformance tests. And Son of Boy is one of the tools that we use to drive conformance tests. So I'm going to let John talk about Son of Boy for a few minutes, and then I will come back to talk to, about the E2E uh, test framework. John, go for it. Thank you, Vlad. Um, yeah, so like Vlad was saying, a lot of these different tools are, are different parts of the puzzle, and, and sometimes we're created to solve different problems. Um, and Vlad, maybe you can speak to this too. With with kubetest2, when I have looked at it and seen the implementations where it's being invoked in code, it's usually about um, setting up the cluster, right? Mm -hmm. I, maybe people in the, the audience can, can speak to that too, right? It yeah. handles everything from like set up a cluster, run the, the E to E test binary from upstream, and then tear everything down afterwards. Right. So right. it's, it's kind of like wrap, all wrapped together if you don't have a cluster that you really care about. It's just the right. CI, like up, test, down. Yeah, um, it's, we're, it, it's it, definitely it, what it is. And uh, Sanabui just takes a different approach. We don't worry about the construction or destruction of the cluster at all. Mm -hmm. We just need you to have the, the queue config so that you can talk to the cluster. So uh, it's some cluster that you have access to and that you want to run some sort of test on. Uh, right. The one thing I'll always try and emphasize, uh, 
about Sanabui is that we don't really own the conformance tests, though. That's a really common misconception. Those tests are, are Kubernetes tests. They live in the Kubernetes repo, the Kubernetes devs who know way more about, you know, networking and auth and how the node should operate. They're the ones writing those tests. And, uh, you know, they publish the images, they publish the test binary as well. And then that's packaged into a, a test binary or a test image. And that's what Sonobuoy can just invoke. Sonobuoy just runs what we call plugins and you can write your own even. So, you know, we'll, uh, let me share my screen and we can uh, kind of show a few things off for Sonobuoy. Everyone will get sort of a infinity here as I look for that, but here, let's All see. Right, there you go. Perfect. Okay. So uh, Sonobuoy, I'll pull up a terminal first. Vlad, does that look good, big enough? Yes. Uh, the terminal could be bumped up a little bit. How's that? There you go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when you do like Sonobuoy, it's a little binary. It's all open source. You just download the binary. That's all it takes to install it. Um, the main command is Sonobuoy run, and it just creates a bunch of things in the cluster that runs tests. If you want to see what it's going to create, uh, we have the little command gen, Sonobuoy generate. And you can see it creates uh, some pods, it creates uh, some configuration, config maps, and all that jazz. Uh, but the real magic is that what it's really doing, Sonobuoy does uh, just this orchestration of launching these plugins and reporting their results. So in this case, this is the, the E to E, the upstream um, Kubernetes tests. You can see it has, yeah, right here. So here's the, here's the image. That's published by the upstream Kubernetes community. Uh, every version that comes out. And you can just run Sonobuoy uh, to launch those tests. And the reason you'd want to use Sonobuoy at all is that uh, it's really simple to integrate into your workflows, whether it's CI or dev, um, because you can really just do things like this, Sonobuoy run, uh, and you can run other plugins by specifying you know, different flags. But then you can say, just wait for that to finish. And then I want to look at, uh, you know, download the results, something like that, or download them and extract them. And then you can even just do like, open up that uh, a directory. So if you download them to temp, and then open them in temp, and that sort of thing. So everything else is customizable, though, um, which is especially why we wanted to talk about it today, as we talk about the EDE framework, because I actually just made, I'll pull up the, the web page. Let's see, so there is a Sonobuoy plugins repo that we've published some uh, plugins. Again, it's all open source, anyone can contribute. Um, some of these are for specific apps, like a, uh, let's see, system D logs or the E to E, that's you know, kind of the default ones. You can do a cluster inventory, CIS benchmarks, that's a security-based one. Uh, again, we're not writing the, the CIS benchmarks, we're just launching Aqua Security, put those up. And, uh, and we're able to wrap that into a plugin so that you can easily run them. If your CI system already runs Sonobuoy for the EDE tests, well, you just change you know, the exact command line, how it's invoked, and you'll still be able to launch them, get the results in the same way, download them in the same tarball. But just today I put up this, where is it? Oh, it's under examples, because it's a simple example, an EDE skeleton. So this uses one of the examples that uh, Vlad had put up in the E to E test framework. And yeah, which we're gonna look at later. Yeah, yeah, so we'll dive into the actual framework, but this already vendors it, gets a Sonobuoy plugin ready. And wow. all you then have to do is go in and change your actual tests. So in this particular one, uh, you know, this one is from the repo, uh, just as an example from the test framework. Just test that something says hello, sure. Well, here you can see that you can also simply reach out to the API, right? You just say, hey, I'm going to get an environment with a, a queue config. And you can actually do things like list pods. Vlad will get into that. But I want to show you would just do Sonobuoy run, target the plugin file, and right, you can get some output like this, which Sonobuoy is able uh, to parse and you know, there's some updates we're going to make soon. All this was just done today, right? That's how easy it is to iterate, <laughs> make your own plugins and whatnot. 
but uh, you know, it creates this output. And then you can see, even if your tests take two hours, you can get status updates as to how the test is progressing. And when you're done, you just download the whole tarball. One of the really nice things I like about Sonobuoy as well, you just need to worry about the business logic uh, and you know, reporting pass fail or output it in a, a standard format. Sonobuoy will be able to parse those common formats. And then in addition, if something goes wrong, you don't have to go and gather all these logs everywhere or you know, check the status of pods. Sonobuoy goes after the test run and checks a ton of information for you. So it's going to get all these different pod logs. So your plugin pod logs are already gathered. Um, you know, so this was the custom E to E uh, custom plugin I just did. It'll also go and gather all this information from the cluster. If you want to look at, uh, you know, what were the source of config maps endpoints? Because sometimes, you know, maybe the service went out, or you can see the let's see, like Sonobuoy, look at the pods and check the actual status um, of, of each container and, you know, when those, those statuses were changing and correlate them with your test failures. Wow. So, you know, That's a lot of people know that you can use Sonobuoy to gather, you know, your test results. But I think one of the biggest values is uh, that we gather all this extra data to help you debug it when something fails. And even if you don't do the debugging, <laughs> you know, what often happens is people will report problems to us and all we have to do is just say, well, give me the tarball of the data. And it's not just their logs, but it's going to be that whole support packet that shows me the state of the cluster at that point. And I can point to how they invoke Sonobuoy or, you know, there was some security setting that prevented a plugin from running. Um, and all that can be really, really useful. So That's awesome, man. I didn't realize you went ahead and, <laughs> and did all Oh, that. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> almost all done. Um, I got to just do some some extra tests, uh, but the skeleton is good to go. Anybody can pick that up now, and uh, we're going to just keep making it better because right now it doesn't do progress messages. Uh, that's one thing we'll get to because I created an issue on. Uh, I'm going to stop my screen. I created an issue on the E2E framework to help mm -hmm. support that. Um, so it's kind of nice that these two testing tools can kind of grow a little bit together yeah. and help solve each other's problems. Absolutely. I, you know, I, when you pinged me on Slack, I, I had no idea that's what you're working on, but it, that's, that's awesome that Son of We already has a, a, a plugin that can work with the E2E test framework, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But before I move on to, to talk about the E2E test framework, uh, let's uh, look at some of the questions because I, I want to make sure we address them. Well, um, I think Walid mentioned that I remember a couple of years ago, I tried to run and check as a result. Oh, that's when Sonobuoy might have been ran online. Not all tests passed in Sonobuoy. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you definitely have to look at Sonobuoy. Uh, it's different tool than it was what, two, three years ago. Oh, yeah, very, very different than like two years ago. And uh, here, I'll, I'll share again. We can, we can do something live. Let's, let's see how a live demo goes. Um, cause some of these things are just, uh, there, there's a tiny, it, I, I'd appreciate any input out how to make these things even more simple, but so if we do like a Sonobuoy run, I have a kind cluster up locally, by the way. So that's where all these things are going to run. We're going to say run something in quick mode. It's running one E to E test that just like creates a pod, destroys it. And then it's going to run the system V logs. We're going to say, wait, let me do that, uh, command I had said before. So we're going to. We're going to sign a buoy retrieve, and we're going to extract those into a temp directory. And we're going to open those in my, um, ah, yeah, pre-flight checks failed. So that's, that's it. Sign buoy delete. So this was one improvement we made. You guys can see this too. Oftentimes when you said to delete and you were waiting, it just kind of stayed here and didn't give you a lot of feedback. But just recently we added uh, a lot more feedback as it's going. So namespaces, especially when you're dealing with like local clusters that you're tearing up or building up and tearing down all the time, namespace deletion can hang. And so as things change with the namespace, we're just going to dump that information out here. You can silence it. There's a flag for that. But you can at least see that things are progressing and you right. can see that maybe a pod is hanging on and not being deleted. Um, so that can be really useful. Let's do this. Same thing when you wait while it's running. 
Now, once that pod comes up, we're going to be giving output the whole time so you can see, um, you know, hey, this is the, the current status. Everything started just fine. This plugin finished. This plugin finished. Okay, now we're done. So let's see. This shouldn't take long. Oh, see, all these in quick mode, as soon as it, it came up, they're already complete. So uh, then it's going to be preparing the results for download. There's some post-processing that happens. And this is something that was recently added, right? So now the EDE plugins are outputting data in a structured format that we understand. Oh, yeah. Here's my code already opening up. Let's go back to here though. So you can see uh, that it passed and it has zero failures. Since it's outputting in JUnit, it's not what we understand as JUnit, we can actually uh, walk those results for you. Um, but I don't disagree that there's a bunch of data in here and when you download, let's do this on a GUI, retrieve, output to just a file, out.tar.tz. Spell. Okay. So sound GUI downloaded this results tarball. You can also just do this. And so once you, if somebody just gives you a tarball, you don't have to extract it anymore. That's the way it used to have to be, you know, a year or two ago. But you can just do sound GUI results and target that. And you can really simply see like, okay, we ran these two plugins, how many passed, failed. Um, the one gotcha that, that confuses people, and we don't have a great UI answer to this. I love community feedback. Things like logs, it's not really pass or fail, right? It's, I just went and got some data. So right. the way Sonobui does this is it, it reports it as passed for some amount of clarity because I had, th I had some nodes. I expected three results back. I got three results. I'm going to call that a pass. If there was one that one plugin that failed and that it couldn't get re, uh, results at all from a node, it would report it as, as failed. So sometimes that can happen if your plugin is, uh, let's do this, Hanabui Jin plugin systemd. This is the definition of that systemd logs plugin. And you can see there's this value result format that says it's raw. It's just outputting data there's no expectation that Sonobui can read it. The reason that this is still in Sonobui is that right, gathering logs is important. Or if you want to be really fancy, maybe you're going to like create a web page that people will just open. So you don't really want Sonobui like trying to parse that. You just want them to view it. Um, but you can do other things like uh, there's a mode here. I think there's like detailed. Right, you're actually going to output all these things that are. Uh, you can pipe through jQuery, and then you can do anything and everything. If you right. don't know, the, the actual upstream tests have about four. What did we say by last time? Like 4,000, 5,000 tests? Yeah, like 5,000, yeah. Yeah. The, when you actually run conformance tests, most of that 4,000 is skipped. Um, but you you can do you know a filter on this to, to check the ones that right. failed or the ones that uh, ran on a a uh, certain node, all sorts of things, depending on whether your plugin runs one place or on all the nodes. Lots of data here that you can parse, though, if you know what you're looking for. Yeah, so to answer Wally's question, yes, if 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 you, conformance is very specifically designed, uh, well, there's different level of conformance, uh, which we will not go into today, but um, do you have to pass everything to say that you're, cluster is okay probably not but if you're testing for actual conformance to say this thing that i'm about to ship is <clears throat> a kubernetes ready uh, or is kubernetes conformant yes uh, so I, mean, I, I would even maybe i'm disagreeing with you Vlad, but i would say yeah you need to pass everything like if you just set up a kind cluster even though it's a dev cluster you're not trying to like ship that to anyone it should pass conformance because conformance it, it starts small and there's only, you know, three, 400 tests. It probably should be bigger, right? The community is constantly trying to add more endpoints that are validated right. as part of conformance. And, uh, you know, so being as small as it is, only three to 400 tests, those are testing core Kubernetes functionality. And if one of those fails, you need to know why it failed, why? Right. right? Like some, some distributions are in that gray area right now where this fails. So technically it's not conformant, but they have some really good reason good and it's reason. like part of their design that should right. fail because 
we handle this differently. And in our opinion, that's better. Right. You know, and they, they got to work with the community to try and uh, square those two things. And to also drive the point that John mentioned earlier, when those tests fail, they have nothing to do with with Subtle Boy. Subtle Boy is basically running the code against your cluster. So it is that's why Subtle Boy gives you all these extra knobs to let you pull back the layers so you can look at logs to see what's going on and why things might be failing. Yeah, with, um, uh, with yeah, logs, the, that was one thing I've made. This is going to be just in the next Sonic Boy release. It was always configurable, but it's hard to know all the knobs that you can turn on something like Sonic Boy. And um, we were always getting the Sonic Boy logs and the namespace for Sonic Boy. So that gets your plugin and uh, the aggregator that gets all the results. But we just added it as default to get the cube system logs because nine times out of 10, when people come to me and say like, hey, these E2E tests are failing, why? It's just, it's it gonna give you a timeout error somewhere in your Kubernetes test. And Sonobuy doesn't know why it timed out. And the right. services might all be up, but the, usually the keys there are you need to look at like kubelet logs or scheduler logs or controller logs of some sort. And uh, so we just made it by default, get the cube system. So it's gonna, right. again, be an extra helpful place to go look. All right, cool. Um... We're gonna to have to move on from uh, Son of Boy. I know it, it, we're yeah. getting like we're getting good at, into it. So what we're gonna to have to do is schedule a Son of Boy TGIK so we can it can be completely dedicated to Son of Boy because um, yeah, I can I can talk about Son of Boy for for a while. <laughs> let, right, let, let's not get too far. But the whole point, Son of Boy now has a skeleton plugin that leverages the E to E framework. So let's talk about how easy awesome. it is for you to grab that. Now, how do we write our own tests with that? And uh, will we yes. get for it, Vladimir? Absolutely. So um, let me uh, do the share thing again. Put my screen on the screen so we can discuss that. Um, so like I mentioned, the, the e 2 framework, you can read all about it. We, we even, we had a, for a while we were you know, in the design phase, so you can read about the design of it and, um, you know, how it came to be, et cetera, et cetera, what are the motivations, et cetera. Um, but what we have today is really we have two framework in one, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So we have what we call the test harness framework, which is the, the framework that you use to design the test and to express the test. But we also have something called a client, um, which is a word on the, you know, K client with a K. I thought that was a good naming. I like that naming. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the, the whole idea behind client is from an observation. As I was talking to folks and we were designing this thing, what I realized is, a lot of the struggle um, and pain points that folks come uh, to, to encounter when, when they're creating tests has nothing to do with writing the test, but has everything to do with the drudgery of using client go and repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so what, what we try to do, what we're trying to do with client is basically give you yet another abstraction layer on top of client go and everything else that has that deal with talking to the cluster and give you some you know give you something that is that gets out of the way quick and early and let you write tests but still let you uh, still give you all the tools that you need to 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 talk to to the cluster express what you want to uh, get from the cluster express or build um uh, objects or, uh, or resources uh, programmatically so you can send to the cluster, et cetera. And all of the niceties that are um, encapsulated in client go and API machinery, et cetera. What we want to do is give you one entry point to, to when we're writing your tests, you can use that that specific package and, and get to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, while I have this page up, I, I will be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to uh, Shweta. She um, 
has been one of the other main contributors to the project other than myself so far. And she's, uh, you know, she's been working hard as a, basically as a side thing that that uh, when she has spare time, she uh, she uh, has helped the project tremendously. Um, so if you want to know what we're planning or what we have uh, included in, in in client, uh, read this document. It's 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 uh, all marked down now, so you can read everything that we're. Um, what we're thinking and where we want to take uh what kind of detail what kind of level of abstraction we're thinking about right now the abstraction that we have is resources and basically it's a crud it's a, it's a type that exposes crud operations against um kubernetes resources so you can create lists um update etc but we're thinking further out uh in control um even infrastructure, a little bit of infrastructure, <clears throat> excuse me, we haven't vet out what that would look like, but basically we want to give you a complete set of tools. So when you're writing your test, you're not, you know, if you don't have to exec out, to, you know, instead of exec out, exec out to, to the shell to get some stuff done, we want to give you something that is nicely uh, wrapped in a, um, in, in some kind of go type to to take care of the um the mundane stuff that that you have to do to write uh to write tests yeah because well, so the way i frame this too is at the intro right you talked about how if you try and vendor and utilize all that that great upstream code you get everything okay so if you then go on the other side and you decide oh i won't vendor it i'll just do it myself okay now you've got a client or a vendor client go and all those types which not to disparage them, client go is amazing and it can do right. so much, but it's right. just the nature of like API machinery and all the types and all the abstractions they have. It, even for a dev that works on Kubernetes all the time, I get super confused at Absolutely. some point anytime I have to, to deal with like API machinery on too many levels. And Absolutely. Uh, so like you said, so, so you might be struggling there and having to reinvent the wheel, but then if you go a little bit farther and you think I'm gonna be smart, and I'm gonna just exec out to cube control to uh, or cube cuddle, however you want to argue about how it's said. Um, <laughs> if you exec out to that, that's great. You could create it, but then like when you get the types now, like how are you gonna decode all that and, and actually do a test around it? Unless you're just gonna literally be testing for like, is the number two somewhere in the output or is failed somewhere in that stream? Um, so, so this is a great, uh, place somewhere in between those, right? You don't have all the bulk, but you don't have, uh, you don't exactly have right. everything and you don't have to deal with just all the string types and stuff like that. That's exactly right. You, you hit the nail right on the head. It, it's, it, it's try, it, it try to fill the gap in between all of these major, um, uh, programmatic packages that are out there to basically accomplishing the same thing, but we want to kind of reduce the surface area of things you have to deal with 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 that package and and get out again get out of the way quickly so you can write tests and and get things done with your tests so again the the project is really two projects in one so we have what we're calling the client and we have everything in the pkg and everything in the, in the pkg is what we're calling the uh the test harness um so before we let, let's stick a take a look at the design doc for that uh where is it so you can see before we don't jump in and code and again like i said the motivation and why we did it it's all there so i'm not gonna be labor on that but the major type that you'll see in a minute is what we call an environment and this is where you encapsulate um, and you represent things that drives the tests uh that you <clears throat> that you um uh, it allows you to pass information around, um, and and basically what we're doing is we are subdividing the the, the the test execution into different stages, and in each stage you can provide hook to do a certain thing, um, whatever that thing may be, um, and then ultimately one of the stage is the actual execution of the tests, and even the tests themselves can be subdivided into slices of stages um 
and you can hook into those to to write your tests. So at a high level, that's what we're doing. So environment is one of the places where you express and manage these uh, these stages. Um, you can set up. Uh, you you have something called setup where you say okay right before any test is executed, I want to do something. So you would shove it, you would provide us with a function um, and that's your setup. And then you have before test, you have the actual test, then you have after test, and then you have finish. Finish is the opposite of setup. After all my tests are executed, I want to do something. And that's what you would do in finish. Um, yes. So I was going to say, so I've, I've only actually used this package once, but I was already asking Vlad, can we add some more data oh, yeah. context to all of these? But I, I want to caution against my own request, right? <laughs> so I still think my request is valid and we should definitely do it. But, yeah, we could definitely talk about your request. But, but this is the problem with um, the current framework upstream is that it's similarly laid out and there is a test context object, which is uh, follows the anti-god object pattern and right. and that's why everything gets tied in because that test context gets handed to every file and every test and then it because it's baked into kubernetes it knows about like aws clusters and vSphere right. clusters or you know every, every type so we, we right. do have to as the the project evolves be very careful what you do add into that um right. or else you're going to recreate the problem um, actually that's that's a great that's a great point um I mean, one thing that we have going for this is that, you know, the it, it's its own thing from the get go. Um, so, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's it's a it's a package by itself. Um, and as you said, we want to make sure that whatever goes in there is as independent as possible, so that we're not pulling things all over. Yeah, it, it was really easy for the upstream to like, oh, I'm just gonna import that one file it's all it's yeah. just right there i just need that type or i need that whatever um, oh yeah so so yeah. now if the pr comes in with ten thousand lines of code um, <laughs> well, i guess that's one of the, the downsides of not having the actual vendor directory anymore um i know there's probably a hundred problems it solves that we don't have that but it was nice to know how many lines of code you're vendoring instead of just how many modules right um, but uh but yeah you still just be careful when those extra oh, yeah i mean that, that's, a great, that's, made. that's a great insight because that's one of the things we want to make sure that we don't get trapped in 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 a position where we you know we're recreating the way it's done currently um so you know one of the thing about this project it's 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 not the fastest moving project because it's it's only two sets of hands right now mostly but that also gives us time to think about a lot of um, uh, a lot of issues like what you just mentioned, John, uh, to make sure that uh, we're not roping in a bunch of unnecessary things. Um, and um, if you notice, if we go back here, and that's another thing I wanted to kind of highlight. Um, so, the so package. I, I do you want to call it? Carlos is saying, "Who loves who loves vendor directories?" And go, I, I'm in that <laughs> pack, or I'm in that group because I want to see what's vendored. Uh, it does not sound like everyone else agrees, though. Um, it, it was big, but you could see it and you could touch it. But well, anyway, still, you could still do that. Well, yeah, yes. Yeah. So let, let's let's table that because that's another that's another show actually. That's <laughs> a whole other. Yeah, show. So, somebody explained to me the the virtues better, right? I've I've read a bunch of blog posts, but I'm I still like having the vendor directory, but it is what it is. Yeah. Um, oh, the point I was going to make is uh, because client. Um, one of the things that we wanted to achieve with a with the uh, with this project as well is we don't want you to if you if you don't have a need for to bring in client you don't have to um, you could just write code like you that like the code that you uh, uh, the example code you did has nothing to do with Kubernetes so it didn't bring anything uh, related to Kubernetes right. What, what did, so the hello example, I copied from your examples and it doesn't use client, but I wanted to make one. I, I was making it for someone internal to VMware as an example. Right. And um, so I had an API call. And so I created a separate issue. Uh, okay. and you can tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong on it. When you created that new context, I needed like a, a new environment with the default in cluster config. And I had to add like four lines where it seemed like I should 
have to add zero. I should just like modify that. Yeah. Line. So yeah, I'll, I'll definitely uh, uh, get to that because I want to understand it because it sounds like um, another uh, request that I had from someone else too, mm -hmm. who who was asking me that. Hey, I mean, I I may have more than one connection or more than I mean, my test may be dealing with more than one cluster at a time. I don't remember mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. how. So I'm I'm wondering if it's the same thing or something similar. All right, so we've been talking about these things in in you know in abstract. Let's kind of go and look at what this thing looked like as code. So this is the project. Uh, let me. We should be able to. See. There you go. See, okay, that, that's the proof. We were talking before the stream about how oh, we yeah. were unable to zoom in on uh, on GoLand, but yeah, um, like I said, it's it's a uh, command and mouse wheel and, and it worked and i had to ask around for that i did not know you could do that and they were like oh yeah you could do that now but anyway so um you know we're not going to go and explore the actual test what we're gonna um the actual project what we're gonna do is look at examples so let's start with um the simple examples yeah if the framework works all you need to know is the example just show me how to use it i don't care right. how it does it right uh let me close the other stuff okay so here's a test um typically you probably won't do your test like that but i wanted to show at the most simplest level what you know what what can be done um i mean if your test is as simple as this you probably should just use go test and be done with it right <laughs> but <laughs> But I wanted to show, hey, this is what we're doing is nothing special. We're not forcing you to think differently about um, your testing in Go. And that's another thing that if you read the the design document, you'll see that one of the things we wanted to drive with this is that we didn't want to take away from what Go already has as far as tests. We just wanted to augment what's already there. So meaning that, uh, you have access to test main, you have access to your test functions. Um, yeah, the fact that you could just run go test. And, is super and you nice. have access to go test. Super yes. Nice. yes. Because then um, I even, I, so on that example plugin, when I used it, I, uh, in the Docker file, I compiled it all and just made the test binary ahead of time as part of the Docker mm -hmm. file so that it runs super quick because it doesn't have to do the actual like go test. The binary is there, right. just boom. Or runs right. the test ahead of time. Exactly. Um, that's a e e that's, test does that as well, but uh, yep. it, it was something that makes it very easy. Yeah. Um, so to your point, because you know we're not adding anything extra, you can leverage your tooling. So I can come here because I've been in GoLand for so long now. I can do this. You know, right click on a specific test and run it, um, and it it will work. Um, so this is like I said, this is a simple test. Um, this is the environment type we talked about earlier. Um, we're starting with a new uh, configuration. So, so it's two things. We have a config and we have a, um, uh, we have an environment and we have a config. But before you even go that far, let me ask a question for you, because you mentioned like in GoLand saying like, Hey, run this test. Um, you know, I'm only now even like still churning on, on the idea of how useful it is because in Correct me if I'm wrong, but like with Kubernetes, right? There's a lot of right, the repo so big. There's some Linux specific parts. There's probably I don't know if there's Seago parts, but like there's some tests you can do that with in the Kubernetes repo, and some you can't. Is that right? I don't. I don't know. Maybe someone in the chat knows as well. If you can just like run a single test with a single like command line invocation, I don't know. Um, I feel like there were some unit tests you could do that with, but not all of them. Yeah, it's yeah. it's possible. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, because um, I'm on a Mac, and so if it's all Go compatible and it's using like, because I know uh, in the configs will show, right? You can use a cube config. The fact that it's interoperable on all the operating systems as well is is really nice. Right. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. No, Sorry. I was just <laughs> so reading. You 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 stir some feelings. I was reading the uh, the comments about vendor. <laughs> 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 Got distracted with the comments. Um, yeah, so uh, 
so at a high level, you have an environment. This is, you know, this is what we're doing here, but the environment you could shove into that environment uh, configuration. And because we're not doing anything crazy, there's, you know, the configuration is just empty. We, we don't have anything in it. Um, so we can start there. And then one of the things we could do to express what we want to test is to create what we call a feature. The feature is nothing more than some kind of structure and memory that keeps track of the test. You can give the feature a name, uh, you can add labels to it, and you can already you kind of sense what we do in that. You can add label to the feature. Um, and then inside that feature, you declare uh, assessments. With, what is it you, that you want to actually test? And that's what we're doing here. Um, and so let's inside... clarify that for me. So uh, the, the feature, like you say, it's just in memory, just really description more than it. it there's nothing else that's, all it is. that's yeah. attached to the feature? Yeah, that's, that's all it is. It's just a, a way of describing um, what it is you're testing. Mm -hmm. um, and we took it a step further and we actually let you express that test here now the reason why we've done that is because the test can also be augmented by receiving context because right mm -hmm. uh, you can't do you can't inject context in 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 your test in your test function directly we, we're not there yet we go yeah when when i was looking at it i wondered you know it seems sort of strange to put the feature inside and have you know that last line that says test the feature it seemed like an unnecessary step but now i get it because the framework that upstream uses ginkgo right. a lot of what it does and what we use it for is so that you could just attach you know a, a tag to it or a exactly. you know some, some random in, in ginkgo version two uh, i think is what it's going to is expanding on that and right. by okay. just embedding it in the function I see that you, you can just get all that programmatically. It, you know, yes. one extra boilerplate line of code and everything is solved. Yeah, you get it programmatically. Um, you, you know, it's right there inside. So as we talk more, you'll see that, again, we're not doing anything outside of the Go, regular Go uh, test framework because mm -hmm. you're, the starting point of your test is really here, is mm -hmm. the test hello. Um, we're just using this to kind of embellish the test and then come down here and say, okay, the thing that I embellish, please test it for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to go and, back. And you, to could, you. you could effectively have multiple features defined in the same oh, test and run test a bunch, but would that be kind of an anti-pattern in this framework? Or is there a reason you, you've already thought of that you'd want to do that? No, actually the reason why it may make sense is you may have a collection of tests uh, that you want to run either together as a unit um, or one of the PR or not one of the issue I have open is, is to use this starting point as a way of doing parallel testing. Like I mm -hmm. want to test this feature. I want to test five features together and go. Oh, um, that, that's a good idea. Yeah. So it could be not just parallel with everything, but parallel within a subset, right? Like yeah, so exactly. A, B, right. and C should be parallel to confirm that works. Right. But Right. run that in isolation from everything else absolutely um so this you know this simple setup shows you that there's nothing really uh magical about what we're doing um it's it, it's part of it you know it's just regular code and it gets tested here um now here's a another example test hello with setup that's what i was talking about earlier where even in the test, you can you can slice your test into stages as well. So that's what we kind of do in here. Um, here we're we're you know a feature can can have a set setup stage, um, and and um, and that setup gets executed before every. So one of the thing I, I didn't mention earlier, you can have multiple assessment in one feature but that setup would get executed once and then um and then you you'll you'll get uh you know you you get the the stage of the setup gets executed before all your assessments and then you get it, your assessment and again right. the reason why you have that instead of just saying like oh put it before the feature is because you could conceivably have a test like a go test that has multiple features yes yeah. so you don't 
you don't want to really pollute that kind of in between space, right? Like if it's attached right. to the feature, put it there. That's the idea. Yeah. Um, I had, I have a, I'll look for it in a minute, but I do have, uh, I have a branch where I'm, I was I was creating a, an example that shows you all of the different stages that you can define, mm -hmm. but I, I don't have it on this branch. But I, I'll look for it in a minute. But before we go any further, let's look at what the so this shows you. Okay, there's nothing to it. You know, if you want to start at that level, you can and still use the uh, the framework. Um, but this example shows you the full breadth of where you can start by give, by having a test main, right? Um, so what is a test main that in, in, in go test test main is an, is the actual, if you have a test main, if you have a function called test main, that becomes the entry point for all your tests in that package. Um, kind of analogous to like a, a suite, right? A test suite. That's where you would define that. So we're taking advantage of that in this, uh, project. Um, this doesn't give you a good, I, I don't like this example. Let me, because it, it's not showing you everything you can do. Well, so I am seeing one thing in there, right? So in that test main is giving you another opportunity to define um, the environment, right? So you're calling yes. inconf.new. So that would be, right, because I, I made that ticket about saying like, man, to get an in cluster config, I have to do these like three or four lines of boilerplate every time. But I probably, if that's the case, if I'm doing a bunch of API stuff, I would do that in test main. I'd get that in cluster config, and right. then that would be part of every environment. Yes, exactly. Okay. And that's why I was saying this. This. So if we were to do test env, just to show you, you could see I could do setup. Um, I don't remember. I do not remember the. Um, there you go. So I could do a setup. Um, and basically, I can define whatever I put in here would be the very first thing that gets executed before mm -hmm. any test gets executed. Um, and I, I believe I can add more than one setup. I, I, I don't remember. Um, and that I'm environment is going to go to every test. Is that right? Or every feature that uses the same? The, right. So the environment what, test, or where does that? Yeah, so here it is up here. It has to be global because okay. again, this is this is the nature of this is the nature of go test because there's no way, nowhere really mm -hmm. to inject things either mm -hmm. via a context or anything. So the only your next best approach is to make it uh, a, a package variable and then get access to it in your test. Right. Um, so if you look here where let's i don't know, okay i'll just pick one hello test yeah and this, this is probably the same reason why like things like ginkgo and those other test frameworks are set up the way they are right there's right there's a few globals and there's a few extra weird steps like if you're not right. used to the framework you don't understand but it it's all probably to get around that that one problem of you want to place yeah. this global context and there's no way to pass it or inject there's, that into your tests there's absolutely no way to do it. Um, so, but what we've done in this project is we leverage uh, uh, context as much as, as much as possible. So, if I go back to test main, right? One of the one the example. This is uh, uh, context propagation. So here, I am creating a context um, or create an environment with a context and immediately injecting a value in that context. And I'm using a number as the key, but this is, you know, bad habit. You probably should use um, like a string or something. Anyway, um, so I inject that value in the context. Um, and then in my actual test, I can actually grab that context or grab that value from the context, which is what we're doing right here. So, mm -hmm. When I get to this point, when my tests are executing, when I get to the test stage, now I'm re each assessment can get access to the context that I created 
without creating extra global variables and without creating and extra global variable yeah. exactly you have a rich type to pat to to basically it's go context so whatever you can mm -hmm. do with go context you can do with here but the other thing too the configuration that that was created you also get access to it here um, configuration has additional things that right now we think are common things that you should get access to, but that might change in the future. But right now, uh, configuration gives you access to things like the client that you may have created um, and some other stuff once we look at uh, some uh, additional example. But context propagation is a big thing in, in, the, in the framework because it allows you to get to things so that um, you're not polluting global all over the place so you can get access to your values. So this makes um, me wonder too, and I don't know if this has ever been discussed, because this, if this is a common problem, we say there's no way to inject anything into tests, but it's staring us right there in the signature. There is the testing.t type. And, and I wonder why they chose not to put context into there. And I, I'm assuming it's probably because they just wanted to prevent people from shooting their own foot and using it as a grab bag for anything and everything. But uh, you so could in theory do that. You, you could. Uh, I mean, how would you do that? Because it's expecting testing.t? Well, no, that's but, what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Like, But what if the type testing.t had a context object in it? Oh, right. As far yeah, as I know, it doesn't? It doesn't. Yeah, I was just looking that up because I was curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be an intuitive place to put it. But Oh, absolutely. Or you, you know, can change it to... You know, like Go has done in a lot of T with context. You know, that's your mm -hmm. new type. Instead of just plain T, and let me inject my context. Because now we also have test main, which is the starting point. It as a progress, you know, natural progression of things. It would make sense to allow me to inject things into my test. But that sounds like a great, um, <laughs> a great. Maybe, issue. maybe I'll file that issue for for. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that. that, that's why we. I feel like somebody we're, probably already suggested that. Probably, um, but that's that's why we, you know, a good chunk of the, of the uh, of the testing framework has to do with uh, context propagation, so that we we have uh, we have access to to these values. So, what the context propagation allows you to do is to push values from one stage to the next and make sure that you get that value as as your test progresses. Um, okay, so let's look at an, um, yeah, there's not more to this. Let me see what's filter. I think, okay, filter, I wanted to show that you can, um, one of the things you can do is define tests with, um, uh, when you define your tests or your assessments or your features, et cetera, and the naming or the names that you're providing they're there to allow you to to do filtering when you're executing the tests um and yeah, and, and to speak to to that too right like people who maybe don't understand the, the full context of how the upstream tests work with ginkgo v1 didn't have this feature i think ginkgo v2 is adding this sort of thing like that yep. yeah the option of having labels because otherwise what you end up with is go test only allows you to filter based on the regex of the name Right. And so you would have test names that include all the things that they include. So you'd have like conformance, windows, <laughs> right? you know, uh, SIG storage should do this. It, like it just gets so long because you're trying to list all this metadata in the title. So it's the idea of separating metadata from the, the human readable description. Right, right. Um, and that's also why we, we have, um, we specifically call out labels as a mm -hmm. thing filter on, on as well. All right. So that's that. Let's look at, there's some more niceties I want to make sure I want to uh, I get to, especially when you start talking about the client. So we mentioned client. So let's look at, um, let's look at this, this example. So the, in this one, we're actually going to uh, uh, talk to the API server, right? So here's one where we actually have a setup. Um, yeah, this one is a custom one. So in oh, this example. You're setting up a cluster too. Okay. 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So this one is doing everything. This one is setting up a cluster, creating a namespace, I think, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I wanted to show all of the moving pieces in this example, right? So uh, we create the environment here. Uh, we do a setup. Um, and in my setup, I'm defining that I want to uh, I want to create a a random name because I wanted to use it. I want to use the name for something. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we created is uh, we have support types or uh, support packages for things like kind because kind is everywhere. We use it all the time. So why not give you a good set of abstraction around kind for you to use? So that's what we're doing here. Um, so we have a type that allows you to create a kind cluster. Today, it is execing out, but pretty soon I want to make sure it's not even execing out. It's uh, if we can leverage the the kind API directly to to do exactly what we want to do with it. That's the that's where I'd like to get to. But today it's for you know to get us where we need it to be. It's a OS exec out to to the kind uh, to a kind uh, local uh, binary. Hey, I mean. It that works, right? And especially if you don't it need works. that back and forth conversation, right? Like for kind, you just, you need it to go in the operation to succeed the end, right? Like it's That's not right. like you're you're checking details that you don't already know, right? You set right. up the config, either it got created or it didn't. Um, exactly. Now, my question to you, do you foresee supporting a bunch of other providers or was the idea of like, give them the simplest test case of having a local kind cluster um, because again, I'm, I'm connecting it back to that idea of, are you going to have a lot of bloat if all of a sudden you're going to import AWS repos? And oh, no, 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 and... no. Um, right now, I think kind is a sensible, uh, is a sensible provider to have because again, it's, it's everywhere. And I'm also getting my clue or, or cues, I should say, from what is going on in uh, Cube Test 2 because you know Cube Test 2 does something similar uh, or has the notion of what they call I think it's called a provider or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, well, Cube Test 2 doesn't of, it set up like any uh, it doesn't support like ten different providers or something like that. I thought that's what all the um, I, I thought all the test grid stuff whether it was GCE or a EKS. I don't know if they've different. adopted Cube Test 2 yet. Um, oh, okay. I, I could just be yeah. wrong. Yeah, I, yeah it's it, it's okay. Um, but KubeTest who out of the box says, hey, we understand that you may want a local provider, a kind provider, you know, whatever those providers do, mm -hmm. but they're, these are sensible defaults. And those sensible defaults, what they do is they give you, you know, you could see how if I was to go and create my own provider, what would that look like type of thing. But mm -hmm. for the project itself, I don't think we're going to get in the, you know, I don't think we're going to get in a place where we're carrying around code, you know, how to start a cluster on different providers. I, to me, it doesn't make sense. And That's it, not the problem you know, you're trying to solve with this. Right. Problem. It's not the problem it's solving at all. Um, kind is here because a kind is part of, you know, it, it's a, a cube six project. Um, it's one, of, I mean, it's the only thing that I know of that, can, well, there are others, but one of the more accessible uh, uh, ways of set, setting up a, a local cluster. So that's why that's why mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's why it's there. Um, so yeah, so now we're we're doing a kind setup, and we we also uh, I'm getting a phone call. Sorry, we still here? Yeah, I still hear you. Okay. You good? Do you need yes, to go? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> Because my uh, my phone is right next to me and it's paired with my uh, headset, it kind oh. of threw me off a little bit. Um, so finish um, is basically how you and you know how you control what happens when all your tests gets executed and they're done. So mm -hmm. we come here and say, okay, let, let's destroy the kind cluster that we uh, we created earlier. So that's what we're doing here. And one of the ways we're doing this, just to highlight this. So we create the kind cluster object here and we shove that in the context. 
mm -hmm. before we before we head out. And because the 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 the, the framework will will forward the context to the next stage. So we eventually get that context here. And one and, other thing, okay. Okay. no, I was gonna add the contract between me writing the test and the framework is that I have to be a good citizen and, and return the context mm -hmm. that the next stage will use. If I don't do that, I'm gonna basically short circuit the, uh, uh, I'm going to short circuit the test where you have to just do that in main, right? You don't have to return context on all your tests or anything like that. You just run the test and you're done, right? If you, if, well, if you're changing the context, you need to, um, you know, you need to return whatever the change is so that it, it probably each individual test has the opportunity to change that, that global context, or does it get set once and pass to everybody? The context, right. Well, the context gets set once, mm -hmm. but you can, basically do the context augmentation and it's created you know uh, it does this with a context value mm -hmm. um and it stores it so you're so not returning you, the original you to, context, uh, returning a... yeah if you go to main underscore test dot go right you're getting the context going. oh wait oh oh sorry okay go to k8 underscore test yes you're gonna get the context you're going to get it. Oh, and, and I do see. Okay. So in the assessment, you are returning context there. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yes. Um, because the, otherwise it doesn't work. We, so it's two ways I could have done this. I could have made it a completely global context and everybody can, um, basically kind of get that immutable copy of it. Well, right. So, the, so I, I took a long time before I came to this particular design decision right how to pass around the context because mm -hmm. that's another you know it, it's another hill that a lot of people uh are willing to fight is how to use context and go um so the compromise i came up with is okay you're gonna get one context at the start of your test mm -hmm. if you change it you're responsible for forwarding it or returning it mm -hmm. um, you don't have to but if if you think that you may need it later on, then you can get through. You can get through it uh, this way. Um, mm -hmm. It's a model similar to I think uh, HTTP request with context or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I I struggle with it because another way we could have done this is to just have a global context sitting at the package level. But if mm -hmm. you do that, then um, you lose the serial nature of having things being available and not available. Yeah, this makes it clear yeah. that it's, it's chained. Just so like, it's just chained. like you might tear down the cluster, well, that changes the context the next thing knows about. And um, each test needs to go into it realizing I'm getting a context. I don't know what it is. I can't assume that it just exists and it's in a good state. Right. Um, kind of have to interpret it. But, but I do see this, you know, it, thinking about wiring up some of the basic boilerplate for these kind of tests, mm -hmm. you had mentioned like creating a namespace. Um, in that test main, again, if you go to the main underscore test, mm -hmm. so you were setting up the cluster and there's, you know, there's a, a setup and a finish. There is there also a before each that you can yes, do? Yes, there is. Okay. I'm just and not so, showing it here. Yeah, because the most common thing is always like, like you said, creating a namespace. Every an E to E test framework upstream does that too, where, mm -hmm. but it's in each test. I, th I think it says like the, one of the first few lines is always like create mm -hmm. new context with namespace. And you have to specify that you want a namespace and then you, it just it creates overhead for the person making yeah. the test. They have to remember to do that. Um, so could you just put it one time in the main, every test gets a namespace. We're going to delete the namespace afterwards, the end. <laughs> Is that, is that right? That you have that option? Yeah, we yeah, we're gonna look at that. So this oh, okay. one, this yeah, this example I wanted to show, let's see. So we see how you you are responsible for setting up uh the whole environment function here. Oh man, time is okay, we're at hour and a half, so we're probably gonna kind of wind it down soon. Um, um and this is you know the the finish. Now let, let's look at the other example that, so if you look at the way I, so this is custom environment function, I wanted to show 
what a custom environment function look like. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. And this is what this is what a custom. But another thing you could do is predefine environment function. And what does that look like? All right. So this is the same. This is the same test, but we're using predefined environment functions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and basically, an environment function is exactly what we just looked at. It's it's a function with a very specific signature that set up understand. So um, this is the cluster name I defined earlier in the in if we come if we look at the old uh, yeah here. In the custom. I, see, I see. Yeah, I see where you go. So we, we have the name, we have cluster, etc. But now, because I have, let's look at this real quick. I have this function, which is called create kind cluster. It's doing exactly the same thing. Actually, it's returning the same environment function we I was doing myself, but I'm basically encapsulating the entire step in one uh, function call to do everything for me. Mm -hmm. So that's what that does. Now you had mentioned uh, namespace. Um, what did I do? So, yeah, so in this case, I, it's still a like global namespace. And I'm curious if you if there's a way to do it uh, for each test. So it's like a pretest, set up a namespace, and then post test needs to reference that same namespace. So you've got a uh, yeah, you could. I'm I'm not doing it here, but you that. could too. You could do something like this before. So what I do before, there's a before each test and before each feature. So mm -hmm. I, before each test is actually before the actual test. Before, mm -hmm. oh, what's going on? Beach ball. OK, here you go. And um, is, is that what you call that nice little button, a beach ball? It used to be a beach ball. Um, oh. Back in the Macintosh days, the old Apple. It used to be a beach ball that spin around and. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I got you. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I still call it. Um, so yeah, so before you know, so you could do before each test, or you can do before each. Uh, what did I say? The other one was before each feature, uh, which does exactly what you think. It's before each feature is actually executed. It'll do a thing for you. So I could change, I could do this. I don't know if it'll work because I, I didn't test it. Yeah, so that's, but the namespace is defined before. So it's going to be the same namespace each time, but. Each test, but, but we could change it. Yeah, but the, the only thing is that you need to have that namespace be the same as the one that you're going to define in the after each test. I feel like there's a way to do it. I just got to think uh, about it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, where it's I, think, I think it's a great, um, it would be a great uh, issue to open and say, hey, look, show me how to do this. I, I will because do that. One of the thing I'm going to uh, I'm gonna figure it out and I'm going to make an example and close my own issue. That's the best. That right? is. Your issue and close your issue. <laughs> that is the spirit, man. Um, so yeah, uh, you know what? let me, so let me finish with this example. And then if we have time, I'll look into the other branch I had mentioned that shows you all the different, um, all the different steps that you can actually hit. Um, so yeah, so that's what the, the predefined, uh, environment function do, because now I don't have to have a bunch of code that is responsible for creating the cluster and destroying the cluster or creating the namespace or destroying the namespace. I can encapsulate that in nicely wrapped function and then just plot the function here and everything looks nice. And I can, you know, I can keep going. And the idea is to show that if you if you're using this as the way to create your tests, you can have, you know, you can have a collection of these that do predefined things for you, predefined steps. Um, and you encapsulate those steps in one function call like we're doing here so that you're not having this gigantic uh, uh, set of code in, 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 in your tests. So that was the idea here is to show you that you can do further encapsulation of your, of your steps. I don't think I'm doing anything different in the tests. No, I'm not doing anything different. 
No, I'm sorry. This is not it. This is it. Yeah, it's. Oh, okay. So this test. Oh, let's talk about the, this. This looks like the different than before. Okay, so the test. Like for instance, this test is just doing assessment. Um, it has something called pod list, and that's exactly all. That's all it does. And this is showing you using client. Um, mm -hmm. We we have access to the config. Um, we say, hey, give me the client that was defined. And this is, at this point, the assessment is assumed that there was a client created. The client was created in my um, in my function in my predefined function that I showed earlier. Where is it? I wonder too. By by the way, is is that example out of date? Because I thought in when when I did it today, you could say like config dot client. And it didn't return an error. Like it would have panicked mm. previously or something. Cause you could just say, yeah, config no, this, is, this is the update. This is the updated one. Okay. So I'm on a branch. I'm on a branch. Oh, okay. Merged. You're on a branch. Okay. And that branch just merged. So the reason why we did this. So if you pulled like the previous release, so you won't see it like this. Mm -hmm. So I had to do some, um, I had to do some some refactoring um, because of some bad assumptions that were done um, when we retrieving the client from from the uh, retrieving client from from the configuration. And the reason why I had to do that is because of flags. Since mm -hmm. I am on the since I am on the uh, branch that I did the flag changes on, I'll talk about flags. So same type of things, test main. Now I'm creating the configuration um, using new from flags. And as the name implies, it'll parse your flags and hand you over a set of flags. It, it'll look for a specific flags, I should say, that it knows about. And learn them you. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it'll look for assessment regex, the feature edit, the labels, the namespace, etc., and uh, put you know and merge that with your with your sets of expected flags, and then I'll just instead of let's uh, look at the readme, and then what you could do is you can run your tests with uh, mm -hmm. with the flags, uh, so mm -hmm. you can say assessment or you know whatever whatever flags you think you you're using in your in your test. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now we support these this these flags. There's a PR out to to do more flags, uh, specifically excluding to say I don't want I so these will do inclusive filtering, saying okay, I only want to execute any assessment with this name. Mm -hmm. And uh, the PR that's out is saying exclude tests. Um, yeah, a question for you about how this is implemented, because one of the problems with um, like Ginkgo is it's not not really a fundamental problem with Ginkgo. Again, not not disparaging them at all, right? Like they, they leverage mm -hmm. a lot of uh, or facilitate a lot of what upstream does. But mm -hmm. I wanted to do things in the past where I, I say like, hey, I want to do like a dry run. And Ginkgo can do that. You can say dry run these tests. So it doesn't actually run them. But what it only has access to is the name because the whole point of dry run is it's skipping over all the business logic inside mm -hmm. of the test. Mm -hmm. So when you do things like um, checking the assessments and those labels, how is that implemented? Because it seems like it's got to go through the go test. It does. Then run it to get the feature. And does, does it gather all of those ahead of time before it ever runs the first? Or does it stream those one at a time? No, it, it knows about them ahead of time. And then, okay, it, it parses right. everything, the whole, like, all the features, all the assessments. All right. The, and, and then it right. applies those regexes as appropriate. And then it iterates. Well, it applies them as it's iterating over them or something like that. But uh -huh. that gave me an idea. It's probably a good thing to create a, a new issue to say, hey, we should uh, consider dry run as a um, all right. As a I have flag it or as, as as a 
<laughs> Who is she? Because uh, I, I can, I mean, I can see how this would be done to where you can still. Mm. Yeah, I can I, tell you I, how dry run is super it. useful. So, like upstream, all the time, people ask us, like, "Well, what tests are there?" That that just mm -hmm. comes up all the time with Sana Bui. Again, we don't own the upstream tests, but they come to us because that's that's how they run them. And um, so, what we tell them to do is, you can run this dry run because those number of tests or the, the names of the tests change from release to release. New tests get added, tests get deleted, and um, so just for like checking what tests exists so that you can build your regex about what test do you want to run? Like what features should enable right. this or that? Um, dry run is, is really valuable for that. Cause then you can even automate tools around that. So you can say, first thing is to list these, then parse the assessments. Then you could even, I, I've thought about doing this is, is making a little web page for different versions of the Kubernetes tests where it'll just uh, get that list of tests so that you can just have a bunch of like check boxes, like this feature, that feature, da, 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 and it'll build the regex for you because people are so can, when you have 4,000 tests, people don't know where to start, you know? Right. Uh, let's see. Uh, that issue is created as well. Awesome. So is, by the way, so this is a new, again, I'm not used to the stream yard. When I put things in the private chat, it says like hosts and other guests can see it, but it doesn't come up in the comments. Do, do people in the comments or people watching, can um, you see the, the, the two uh, issues I've listed? They may not. If it's the private one, it, they probably won't see it. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't have any way to, to share something into the comments, but I, I know that's because like stream yard is potentially oh, yeah, streaming just, out to multiple places and just put it in the, uh, the show notes, just drop it in the show notes. Oh, oh, that's, that's the idea. Again, yeah. if you didn't know, it's my first time doing a TGI. <laughs> ah. All right, let's see. I'm not going to play with this. Um, okay. So, what else we need to cover? We're going to switch to uh, oh, main test. I, I made a change here. Um, Sweep main test. They are in the show notes now, and I and I have to have a silly uh, confession. I still get a small bit of uh, accomplishment when I format a markdown URL really nicely. Right? It looks ugly when you just paste it. And you make it look nice. I, something about that is just very pleasurable. <laughs> all right. I think. All right. So let's see yeah. something here. So I changed the I changed the branch and I'm gonna look at one of the example the life cycle example I think that's the one that shows everything. Um, so the whole idea behind this, this example and it's not merged yet. This is something I was working on and got distracted by some other issues so it never got merged. Um, but it's to show you that like all the uh, hooks and, and being used. So you have setup, mm -hmm. and I don't remember what this test does. So you have setup, mm -hmm. you have before each feature, and you have after each feature, you have finish. Um, actually, I'm, I, don't have, I don't have before test, so I'm not even showing everything. Okay. And this is where that first issue I filed today kind of comes into play. Because it seems to me intuitive that like before each feature should have access to the feature that it's coming before, right? Like that way, if you want to like, let's say output the output of each test to its own file, 
right? And you need to create the file based on the name or something like that. Or before each test, right, it's going to create a namespace based on the name of that um, test. The same sort of thing, right? Like you need yeah, some um, information about the feature there rather than just the config uh, or the context. But again, like maybe there's some way to finagle those or, or maybe we uh, just need to change the signatures a little bit. I don't know. I mean, these were added maybe a month or two ago. So it's it's a good thing. I mean, I'm definitely open to, to feedback because I was thinking one way, but mm -hmm. if, you know, if you think that it makes more sense for something else that, you know, we're definitely open to, to get that. Um, yeah. I mean, like, like I said, there's a balance there, right. To add some extra yeah. information and to not overburden uh, either the, the callers of it or increase the number of, of dependencies too yeah. much. But as long as we're not, you know, importing new new modules or anything like that. Like, I don't think no, it's- No, no, no. Um, yeah, so, okay. I think, I mean, I, I definitely wanna, I, I'd like to see that, uh, I'd like to see the um, the issue that you open to, to kind of look at it and see what, uh, what we're missing and what we can add. Mm -hmm. um, guest number. Oh, that's so. This is the setup, and you come here and say before each feature, after each feature. I mean, what I was thinking is that um, in the feature, before each feature, you you should get access to the context and the config, and not necessarily anything else. But you're saying past the actual feature, right? Yeah, yeah. So after each feature should have the feature in question, mm. after each assessment or whatever, like should have the thing it's talking about. Um, it, it gets a little messy if they're nested, right? Do you want to yeah. do all the things that it's nested within? Um, maybe, maybe not. I'm not even sure I'll have access. Yeah, I should be able to have access to it. But then what you don't want is what do you do when you get access to that feature? Yeah, you have to be careful, you know, a, <laughs> right. a little bit of buyer beware, like you should right. mutate some things right. that might change the flow, but um, right. I, don't, I don't know. So some, yeah, if, okay. If you're going to no, shoot, shoot, shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, so this is showing you that I think what, what I was doing is, so we create a new feature, we call it guess. The setup is we are generating a, a we, so here we create a, a, a file, though we, we just generate a file name. We push it in context. Uh, before each test, we open the file and we put something in that file so that it's available for before each test. Um, and set up for the, for, for the assessment, we look, because we, we get set up first for each, uh, for, the, uh, for the feature. We grab, I think we're opening the file, read it, grab the data. And so this is a super silly um, example, but I wanted to show all of the things that you can do and how the context propagation helps you in, you know, getting data, do something to it, push it, push it to the next stage so that you can get that data, for instance, a lot of the stuff could have done in could have been done in one step, mm -hmm. but I kind of stretch it out over multiple stages, just so we can uh, show that um, the the step the thanks Mark context propagation is 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 helping right in the next environment, etc. Yeah, um, and, and I know we're running out of time, so you're talking about the the actual harness and the framework, but but go to an example where you use that client again because I've got to okay, say using sure. it today that was my favorite part, right? Like using one framework versus another framework, potatoes, potatoes to some extent, right? As long as it has the features that you need, which like right. for Kubernetes, especially like all those different types of labels and metadata is important. But for ease of use of writing your own tests, I, I can't emphasize like, it's so nice to, uh, let's see if we can find one with the client, go to the Cades test rather yeah. than the test. I mean, to be, I, so your favorite is that. My favorite is 
I got to this, I, I got excited. I'm like, ooh, that. <laughs> no, yeah, the decorator <laughs> pattern that you use there so that you can just say like, do this each time, do this each time, and that it just keeps right. chaining it. That is really nice and clean. I do appreciate that. But yeah. when you're writing right. the individual tests, which is like the ultimate yeah. goal here, the fact that like, so on line 34, you just define the pod list. Nothing oh, else yeah, yeah. 35 is type specific except that you pass that pod list. So like if all of a sudden instead of wanting the pod list, you need the deployments or you need some CRM, oh, right. like all you have to do is change the type that you pass in. You don't need to navigate API machinery. It's, uh, like, oh, right. You no, know, it's this different yeah. type or it's this different factory or whatever. Yeah, the, the so predefined types and the yeah, the predefined interfaces you don't have to worry about. The, yeah. the generated um, uh, clients. Because you, uh, you just said, uh, so so that resources, um, it, it only matters that you're giving it something that is, is it what time dot, like assignable or something? Yeah, something that implements resources. Uh, okay, which resources dot resources. Yeah, which if, you, if we, it's, I don't remember. It, I'm pulling that from, where did I pull that from? Hang on. Here it is. Yeah, I kind of just closed my eyes and appreciated that I didn't have to know, right? Like as the implementer, right. you did that. Right. And I just said, I don't want to know where that import came in. When I did all this, it only had, you know, like three imports and then, you know, like a dozen uh, go.sum entries, which for a Go project, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, so, so I didn't want to follow the rabbit hole of how you got all these types. Okay, so oh, so I, I was thinking of something else. Um, resources is this, but for that to work, uh, how did it work? Let's go into clients. Oh, there it is. I am using controller runtime client. Controller runtime. See, and I, I don't think I've ever actually used controller runtime. Well, client. controller runtime is one of the underpinning of uh, cluster API, um, and. Um, in uh, uh, what's it called? Builder. Um, I'm drawing a blank. It's getting late. Um, I can't think of the name of the uh, project. This, this just makes me think. Like I, I maybe need to, as the Sonobui, one of the Sonobui maintainers, look at how we do the queries because maybe we're doing it too hard. Maybe we're doing it the hard way because we use the dynamic client and we scroll the API server to get the group version and kind of each thing. And then you have to create like a creator or a factory or something, and then you can list it and then you can record it all. Yeah, that's however kind of this did it was way really easier. And maybe I need to just some of needs to <laughs> need to test. Well, so for search, this doesn't work well for search. So if mm -hmm. you have an unknown type that you searching for, mm -hmm what you just described is you're probably going to keep doing that. But if you okay. know the ahead of time what the type is, like it's a pod or it's a, you know, deployment, et cetera, et cetera, this mm -hmm. will work. Um, uh, I'm still trying to remember the uh, cube builder. It, mm -hmm. it, it escaped me. Cube builder uses controller runtime um, as it's underpinning and Cluster API uses Cube Builder, et cetera, et cetera. But controller runtime is where that little trick comes from. Okay. If your type, uh, if your type implements, uh, I think it's API machinery runtime dot object, which all objects that are represented um, in this in the uh, API server should implement, including the unstructured objects. Mm -hmm. As long as that's true. It'll be a it'll uh, the 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 call that you just saw will be able to handle that type. That'd be maybe a, a good example too. I, I know there's another issue for just like creating more examples, but like how to deal with CRDs or unknown right. structures or something. Absolutely, with that uh, controller. Maybe that's a, a good idea. That, that's definitely a good idea um, because then that'll also help us shake out anything that uh, we haven't uh, any unforeseen uh, bugs that we haven't uh, come across. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that we've we've covered pretty much everything that you can do with the. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to John's favorite part, which is this. <laughs> um, 
Uh, this, and by the time you see the code, this would have changed slightly, but it's the same idea where, you know, as John mentioned, this could be a pod. And actually, if you scroll down here, we are doing the same type of thing, but with a deployment, it doesn't mm -hmm. care. Um, and we, we, and then the other thing too, you can, we're doing create up here. We're doing get up here on the same, um, resources type. We're mm -hmm. also doing delete and nothing, the, the, the affordance for using the API is the same. It doesn't care as long as you give it what it expects, it, it'll work. And it took a lot of work to get it to be that simple as everything that you try to get simple, but I wanted something that is, you know, mind numbingly simple to use. And I think we've gotten to the point where it is. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to say that that is legitimately my favorite part of the, the thing. So I appreciate the work that went into that. Also, oh, and this is where you were like, you were asking me if you can do multiple tests and this mm -hmm. is what that. Um, this is, it's testing a pod and a deployment feature. Um, oh, okay. And, yeah, multiple tests in the same way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And as you can see, there's a teardown. So this particular feature has a setup, has an assessment and has a teardown, mm -hmm. meaning that before this assessment is executed, we'll do a setup and after it's done, we'll do a teardown. And what that gives you is compartmentalized where you do things. You no longer have to put every, all the code that would do that here. You could say, okay, you know, in my setup, I'll do one set of steps. The assessment will focus on the assessment. And then when everything is done, I'll put everything down here in teardown so that I'm not polluting my assessment with infrastructure stuff that mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the test. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to show that. Um, all right. Well, we are at the two hour mark. I yeah, think we, I am calling it quit. Yeah, it's, it's, done. it's it was to, uh, keep rolling with us. And and I regret, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about when talking about Sonobui was was Cube Hunter. That was something that somebody yeah. wanted a, a talk on previously. But I guess maybe we'll punt that. And when we'll at some that. point in the future, Sonobui does a talk then I'll, I'll focus yes. some more on some of those security plugins. We've got the CIS benchmarks, Cube Hunter, um, there's the NSA hardening guidelines. All those things are uh, are out there and easily plugged into Sonobui. And so we'll, we'll talk about them all. Absolutely. We'll definitely have to have a show uh, Sonobui specific. Um, and I'm pretty sure uh, we'll, we'll find a time either right before the, the end of the year or maybe when, you know, when the new year rolls over. All right. Well, that's it for me. I've been talking for quite a while. John, big, big thank you for, uh, you know, for stopping by and helping me out. It made a world of difference, uh, made the show that much better. Um, thank you for everybody who stuck for two hours. Um, I'm, I don't know if there's many of you left, but if you did, thank you. And that is a wrap and see you uh, at the next TGIK. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you.